Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today I'm going to turn this Evo 64 board that I got into the ultimate Commodore 64 synthesizer that is catered to my particular needs. So the Evo 64 board is a reimagined classical Commodore 64 board that uses a lot of modern components and uh, most of the original chips fit in here and are usable in here. It has some additional functionality including a built-in dual SID setup so two sound chips are usable in this and also it comes with the option of using nice pre-amplifier boards. I have the new tube 64 in here that got provided with my particular review board. And among other things, those two components give this superb sound output capabilities. So my plan for today is to turn this into kind of a musical instrument that is usable in my audio DAW setup as a kind of a standalone synthesizer and also as a MIDI controlled device. And I'm just going to show all the steps I'm going to take, many of which also apply to other Commodore 64 replica boards or original Commodore 64 boards, even the ones that only have one single SID chip, which are still amazing sound output. The Evo 64 board was designed with using it as a musical instrument or an audio source in mind. So there are some things that make things considerably easier with this board that you would have to work around with other boards. But most of the things I'm going to show are completely doable on a regular Commodore 64 board with some added expansions or things like that, or even on a stock Commodore 64 board. So I hope this is going to be interesting, not only for people who own the Evo 64, which admittedly is a niche product kind of and it's also not super cheap. I want to thank the Evo 64 team again for providing me with this review unit and letting me keep this and work with this. It is a super nice board as you've probably seen in my review video if you have watched that. So my plan for today is to turn this into a very usable, pretty limited to its use case Commodore 64 musical instrument synthesizer kind of thing. And for that purpose, I am going to put it in a bread bin case that I've already chosen. I am going to add some additional switches to be able to access the functionality I actually need from the outside of the case in an easy manner and also in a manner that uh, this could be used on stage or something like a musical instrument would be. So I'm going to try to make this a rugged construction that is not prone to failing. And obviously most of the things I'm going to do are kind of uh, adaptable to your particular use case. I'm just going to mod this in a way so it's usable to me. And this process is going to involve drilling into a Commodore 64 bread bin case. So I chose this one, which was a completely destroyed case. It had several holes around here, also here, which I tried to fill with uh, some epoxy filler. And I also painted this because it was super discolored. It is a pretty nice looking bread bin case, but I think this is the candidate that I want to use for this because it was broken and I'm not destroying like a good Commodore 64 bread bin case. So what I'm going to do is to add some potential meters to control the pedal inputs actually, because those are used for a lot of audio software that is available for the Commodore 64. I'm also going to add a row of switches that allow me to access the functionality I need. I thought about this for a couple of days and the functionality I actually need is the pedal controls. I'm going to add two potentiometers here and I'm going to add some switches to the back side, I think, because they don't get in the way and are not easily switched. And those switches should access the internal synth card that we are able to put on the ROM in here, on the EEPROM, and switch to that. And uh, the other switches are going to be to switch to different 
sit access modes. We have the ability to switch this to a dual mono sit setup, which is useful for playing tunes that are designed for one single sit. It is going to address both sit chips in here at the same address, so both are playing the same thing at the same time. Currently I have an 8580 SID chip and a 6581 SID chip in here. Both are sounding completely different and even if they play the same thing you get a nice stereo effect from that as I've shown in the previous video about the EVO 64. So I am going to add a switch to switch between stereo, SID addressing mode which is used by some software and mono dual SID setup and I'm also going to add another switch so three switches that is going to switch the address of the secondary SID chip because different software needs different addresses for that and I bought a Messiah cartridge to have MIDI output. This uses the SID in another address than most other software does so we need that functionality to make use of a dual SID setup with this cartridge. And I also have this thing which has been sitting here unused for quite a while which is the Commodore Music Maker music keyboard. This is just kind of a keyboard overlay for the Commodore 64 bread bins that you can place on here and have a keyboard on here that actually just actuates the keys underneath. But it makes this quite usable actually, it doesn't feel bad. <laughs> it feels like a cheap small keyboard. I'm not a good keyboardist at all, uh, not sure if I'm going to use this at all but I want to have the possibility to plug this on here and have a little keyboard to use this as a standalone instrument basically. So my potentiometers are going to go here I think somewhere where they don't interfere with this and are still easily accessible. And another thing I really want to add to this are two audio jacks to have the two sits on proper connectors that are going to be easy to integrate into my audio setup or other audio setups. Yeah, that's basically the plan. Let's see what we can do. I am going to remove the board that is currently in this case. It's just a regular Commodore 64 board and I'm going to put this in here. But I need to do some modifications on the EVO board beforehand to be able to add the functions I want to add. I'm also going to put heat sinks on all the original chips I think because they run rather warm. And most things I need to access for the switches and things like that already have pin headers on this board which is slightly different from the production version. This is an early version of that and uh, for example you can see on this new tube that it still has wired connections to the board which the newer version of this doesn't have, it just plugs in. They also changed some spacings for these jumpers that have dip switches just plugged in here. You can remove them and there's rows of jumpers there. They changed the spacing on the PCB slightly so it's easier to fit proper pin headers there. The EVO board also has positions where I can add pin headers for the joystick ports, which I'm going to do as my first step, I think. Uh, just going to populate these holes here with some pin headers so we can easily connect our potentiometers there to have the pedal functionality and also I'm, I'm just going to put pin headers on all of these because it's going to be easier to change things around in case that is going to be necessary. And all things I'm going to do today are completely reversible except for the holes in the case that I'm going to drill. So first step let's add some pin headers to the joystick ports here. And these are just regular square pin headers uh, because they are easier to plug connectors in. So we need rows of four and a row of five, I guess. Two rows of four and two rows of five. So yeah, that's the first thing I'm going to solder these pin headers into these positions here. I'm just going to put these in here, which should hopefully fit. And there we go. That's our 
connections for the joystick ports made with pin headers. Now uh, I'm going to clean up all the ICs I put heat sinks on and that is going to be the regular ICs. This uses a PLA replacement, the coupler, and that is not going to run nearly as warm as the original PLAs. So the only things we are concerned with are mainly the SIDs, which run pretty warm, and the VIC2 graphics strip, which runs pretty warm. Processor also runs a bit warm, and the CIA chips. So I'm going to clean these up and then glue some heat sinks on them with some thermal compound that is actually heat conductive glue, basically. And then we're going to have to let the glue settle for quite a while, and we're going to have time to work on the case. I also added a two-prong pin header for a reset switch. It has a reset switch on board, but obviously we are, if we want a reset switch, I'm not sure about that, we need that outside the case to be able to access it. Now cleaning the surfaces of all these chips, and then I'm going to glue some heat sinks on there. And this is just IPA. And these are the heat sinks I'm going to use. They have fins, these are aluminum. I'm also going to clean these from the backside with some alcohol. I'm going to use a cheap heat sink plaster is what it's called uh, that I found on eBay or Amazon a while back. This works incredibly well actually for it being such an inexpensive product. Cleaning these up, they come in different sizes. I'm going to try to put a link in the video description in case you're interested. These are actually pretty good for the purpose. Uh, these are for 40 pin dip chips and these are for 28 pin dip chips. And I'm applying the heatsink plaster to the chips because the heatsinks are a bit larger than the chips. You don't need very much of this. And then we just apply the actual heat sinks. Just moving them slightly and get them as straight as possible. Just wiggling them a tiny little bit to spread the adhesive a bit. The most important ones to heat sink are the VIC-2 and the SID chips because those run quite warm and are the ones that are not as easy to replace. They are expensive chips. So uh, this shall cure without me touching it so we don't dislocate the heat sinks. So the bottom side of the case doesn't have a lot of room for uh, adding connectors or switches or anything like that. So uh, we are going to mostly put stuff in the top half that has the keyboard. There's a lot of room on this back side here and that's where I primarily want to put things and the potentiometer is probably somewhere next to the power LED on the top side of the equation here somewhere like here so we still have access to those uh, when the keyboard overlay thing is put on here. So what I need to add to this case half are two potentiometers that I'm going to locate somewhere here, close to the power LED. I bought these super sturdy Goldo potentiometers, which are linear 500 kilo ohms potentiometers. Uh, usually in pedals you have 470 kilo ohms potentiometers for the Commodore 64 pedals, but 500K is going to be perfectly fine for this purpose. Uh, the resistance of the original pedals varies quite a bit, so uh, yeah, 500k is a totally acceptable value for those. Then we want to add two of these audio jacks, and for the switches, I kind of want to go with these, which are mains power switches. And admittedly, they are a bit over the top, but uh, I want something that is sturdy and that's not easily accidentally switched on or off. So I thought these might be suitable for this purpose. We need three of them, one to switch on the internal synth card. So uh, we are going to switch the Evo board into cartridge mode, which is actually a feature that that has. We can put the cartridge ROM into the EEPROM and switch to that with one 
switch. We want the second switch to be the switch for the SID mode, like dual mono or stereo for different use cases. And we want the third switch to be able to switch between the addresses for the secondary SID to be able to use the Messiah cartridge. So yeah, the plan is to have this easily switchable to different modes of operation basically that I need. So the three switches are going to go somewhere in the back here. Same for the audio jacks, probably somewhere in the center. And these two potentiometers on top here so we can access them while playing the keyboard. And there's plenty of room to add a number of connectors here and switches and potentiometers. So I think uh, that should be a reasonable plan. I think I want to temporarily remove the keyboard while laying this out and drilling and things like that. And all the connections to the board are going to be through pin header connectors actually. So that is all going to be removable and placeable on other switches. I'm going to probably going to solder directly to the switches. But the other end on the board is going to be removable. At least that's the plan. And I think these uh, main switches are going to look pretty nice on this. Not the regular thing you would put in a 64, but yeah, I think that's a good option, actually. I'm going to put some masking tape on here to see where the positioning should be. I guess these should be located somewhere here. We're only going to see the top half of these and I'm going to put a nice cap on them, of course. And we're going to keep them in a straight line with the power LED, I think. That would be the best way. So this one shall go here. And this one shall go roughly here. Oops! <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is brittle. I'm going to have to glue that back. <laughs> I didn't even put a lot of force on that. Maybe it's not the best idea to place these like this. Yeah, we're going to have to add a plate to that from the back side, I think. Of course something goes wrong. It was too easy. Yeah, but uh, when I screw these in, this is hopefully not going to be too visible. I didn't think that the plastic would be that brittle, but it apparently is. So probably it's a good idea to put a bit of reinforcement behind that. Yeah, I think I want to put a little plate here for the potentiometers and uh, try to fit these in there. Should be pretty easy to solder to these uh, while they're in the case and I'm going to put all the components in there and solder while they are in place, I think. So yeah, I'm just going to add this uh, piece of plastic as a reinforcement from the back side there. I'm just going to glue that in. Just using super glue here. It should be perfectly fine. Of course we're losing some cooling vents here, but that should be fine. And the switches shall go something close to the edge of the case here. Something like this. And we're going to uh, pre-drill these holes and use a bit of masking tape and then use a step drill to widen them to fit the actual switches. And the output jacks should be somewhere like here. So put a bit of masking tape on there to be able to mark stuff. And these uh, switches should not interfere with these uh, case hinges. So we're probably going to try to fit them inside this area here and the audio jacks somewhere like here close to where the audio connector on the board is actually. There is a pin header for that. I want them two centimeters apart I guess at least. That would be 2.5 centimeters apart. So that's where we want them. Yep, that actually seems to make sense. And we should have our audio jacks. Also three centimeters apart. The same height. So yeah, that's what I'm aiming for, I think. Audio jacks 
these things potentiometers. So let's mark the positions here carefully to not risk damaging the plastics. So that's our drill positions. Uh, switches, audio jacks, potentiometers on top here. I'm using a steel drill bit. I'm using a small one, I think a four millimeter drill bit to do the pilot drilling. And then we're going to see which diameter we actually need and use a step drill to widen the holes. I think I want to start with these because they are the most notorious ones. Okay, not too bad. It's instantly cracking. Oh, that's not good. I was hoping for this to hold up a bit better. Let's see how the other parts go. And I'm pushing against the plastic from the backside here. So these potentiometers need around 8 millimeters. Probably should use a step drill for this as well, to not rip the plastic too much. Yeah, we lost one fin there, I think. Not too bad. Yeah, so we're going to have to fix that in post. Yeah, but it's not going to look that bad, I guess. Yeah, I think we can make this work in some way. Yeah, it's probably not going to look that bad. Kind of a pity still, obviously. Maybe I'm just going to fill that in with some black paint. It is pretty unfortunate that we lost that fin there, but yeah, I guess we're going to have to live with that. If we put some knobs on here, it's going to look decent enough, I guess. I'm going to paint the gray plastic underneath there black. Uh, not recommended drilling here. Probably if you don't use the keyboard overlay, you should drill here in the solid plastic. This wasn't a smart move, so please don't do it like I did. <laughs> so the audio jacks, we need something like nine millimeters. That works. At least that works. <laughs> so these are going to come out here like so. Which should work fine. And the switches are, as I said, uh, roughly two centimeters. So we're going to have to drill some larger holes. Let's see how that goes. There we go. That should be that. That works reasonably well. Kind of hurts drilling into a C64, even if this case was kind of destroyed. There we go. Okay, so that should be our three holes for the switches. Let's remove the tape. Let's see how that is going to look. That doesn't look too bad, actually. Uh, as I said, I'm going to wire this up while these are in the case already. So that shouldn't be much of an issue because we have a lot of room to solder to put wires on those. These are actually dual pole switches, so we can switch two things at a time. I don't think that is necessary in this case, but uh, yeah, just in case. Could switch all kinds of things with these. Yeah, that should work really well. That's good. I like that. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I think that's all the things I wanted to add to this. Now for the wiring. So I waited for several hours and now the glue is actually settled to an extent so that we can handle this without risking these heat sinks to come off again. And I want to put this in the bottom case 
now to be able to determine the cable length we need. And the EVO board fits all Commodore 64 cases fine. The screw holes line up with the screw posts in the cases. There is a little caveat though on this pre-production unit and that is these uh, screw posts here or these standoff posts on the joystick ports. Uh, they interfere with this bezel that doesn't quite line up with the screw posts, uh, screw holes here. So we are going to remove these and replace them with some regular screws. On the production units I think they use another kind of connector here and you don't have that problem. Unscrew these and put regular screws in there. And now our bezel should fit on here which is actually screwed through the circuit board. And there we go. That's that one in. And that's the other one in. And our ports are fully accessible now with the bezel in place. Nice. So the board should now perfectly fit into our bottom casing here. And we're going to screw it down. Hey, and this is actually the first time my EVO board goes into a proper Commodore 64 case. Yay! Let's determine some of our wire length. So we are going to have to wire our potentiometers to joystick port 2, which is this one, to the pin headers we put in there. We are going to have to wire two switches to this row of pin headers. If I remove this dip switch, we should be able to see there's pin headers underneath, so we can easily just plug in there. One switch is going to be for this JTAG header, putting this into cartridge mode, and then we are going to have to burn an EEPROM with the synth card in the appropriate position, and we don't even have to choose a memory bank on the multi-ROM that is in here to access that ideally. We just have to put this into cartridge mode and if we disengage the cartridge mode we should be in our regular basic. That's all I want. Of course you could add more switches or like a key man works with this switch array and you can switch to different banks of this multi-ROM which includes a variety of kernel ROMs, basic ROMs, uh, character ROMs and cartridges. And depending on which EEPROM type you put in here you can have a lot on there. And I'm going to just solder to the side on the top casing and crimp on little connectors on the other side to go on the pin headers. Uh, bought this assortment of different sized connectors. They all use these little pin connectors here that you can just crimp a wire to and put them in these casings which have different pin counts. So we're going to be good. I also spray painted this patch here that was gray in the same black color, which looks rather okay. So uh, I want to be able to open this up like so. I just put uh, an audio plug in there and this literally clears this capacitor by a millimeter. So I'm probably going to put some electrical tape on this, on this side so we don't touch it accidentally with the tip of that. Uh, the location is probably not the smartest one. But our switches should clear everything and yeah, we're going to have a little very short audio path which, which is good. The connector for the audio is located here, which is uh, directly located under our audio jacks. Yeah, I think I want to start with wiring up the potentiometers. And these should be wired up in a way so that they have the highest resistance when turned all the way counterclockwise, which they are now. And I already determined that the left pin on these from this angle is the one that gives us the high resistance. And uh, yeah, basically you have three pins on these. The center pin is what actually moves so that changes resistance and the outer pins here should be the lowest resistance these potentiometers have, which is very low in both cases and this should be the side 
that they have the highest resistance on when turned all the way counterclockwise. If you want to wire them up the other way around, you need these two to be connected. And we're going to run some wires from there to our joystick port. Uh, you can actually connect two pedals. Each joystick port has two pedal inputs, X and Y position. The regular pedals you get for the Commodores only have one connector and there's two pedals on that one connector. And we're going to wire these up just like that. And the standard connector for the synth card, at least, is uh, port 2, as I've said. So we need wires from here to here. Pin 7 is the plus 5 that is going to both of these rightmost connectors on our potentiometers. And the other ones are going to be wired to pin 9 for the first one and pin 5 for the second one. Pin 9 and pin 5. I'm just using regular wire here. I'm going to use a shielded wire for the audio connections, but for the other stuff, we just use regular wire. I'm going to put pin headers on all the other ones as well. And yeah, basically we don't need to show you the whole process. It's just crimping on those pin headers and then soldering to our connectors, which shouldn't be that difficult. <laughs> Hopefully. So I crimped and soldered all my connections and for the audio I actually went with this super high quality audio cable which is super stiff which needs to land here. I'm not sure if that's going to work but we're going to see. Uh, yeah, the stiffness of the cable is kind of what hinders that. There is a connector. This is a uh, input-output connector for the SID and also the composite signal is on there and the LUMA and the SID inputs. Uh, this is a 4-pin connector or this is an 8-pin connector but we are only going to use one side. So we're going to see our ground which is only one ground for the audio should be here and our out one should be on the opposing side and this is our output two that should be the last one here yeah so this looks like a cd-rom connector cable which it kind of resembles for a reason because it is an audio cable on ground to uh, audio connections i totally forgot about the keyboard so we're going to screw that in now quickly before anyone notices that I forgot about that. Then we're going to plug in all the other connections. It should be a piece of cake, just following the pinouts. Okay, let's wire this up, I guess. So our first switch should go to this JTAG labeled connector. And it should short the second row of leftmost pins. That is labeled as a diag, and that enables the first diagnostic ROM that's on the EEPROM. 
which is a regular cartridge ROM. So we should be able to activate the synth card if we close this switch. The second one is our SID mode that should be connected on this EVO mix SID jumper. The first jumper there. And our third switch is for the address that should be for our IE1 and IE2. I'm not quite sure if I need both of them to be closed. If in doubt, we can still remove one of these wires. The instructions are not clear on that. It talks about both of them. So I suppose we probably have to close both of them for the Messiah card to find the secondary SID. So now our buttons here or our switches should be a synth card activation or at least the first cartridge image on the EEPROM. We didn't burn the EEPROM yet. We should have our SID mode stereo or dual mono and we should have the address for the secondary SID switchable on these buttons. We should have audio out now for the pedal wiring. Thankfully our pins are numbered. We are using port 2 which is the one that's more backwards. So that should be pin 7 for the plus 5 volts and then we have pin 9 and we should have pin 5 which is this one. And then we of course need to plug the LED back in, which is the shortest cable of them all. Don't know what I was thinking when I made that. Everything should be connected right up. Our audio cable we should route somewhere here, I guess. And then the audio cable is not ideal because it's too stiff. Super high quality cable, but for this purpose, probably not the best. Yeah, and that should be our synthesized <laughs> Commodore 64. And it looks kind of punk rock, uh, but that's the purpose. Let's give this a quick test run, I guess. So, connected this up to this monitor and to my self-made power supply. All the switches are in the off position, so this should technically start up as a regular C64. Which it does. So, and if I uh, flick the first switch after turning this off, we should be able to start our diagnostic. Nope, but we have less basic bytes free. So maybe there is no diagnostic on this, this ROM. So let's see what happens if we switch this. And then this. That should give us our first diagnostic. There we go. Okay, so the first slot is empty probably. Should put a synth card image in there. But our two cartridge switch works. That's good. We just have to put a cartridge image into the first position on the EEPROM. I don't think there's one in there. We're going to take a look at that shortly. I made some slight adjustments to this. I added these knobs, which are probably not going to stay on here because they are a tiny bit small for my taste, but uh, yeah, they look decent enough. I also made the LED cable a bit longer so we can prop this up in an easier fashion. And I made a mistake when wiring up these audio jacks. I switched ground and signal wires. So I made that fix. And we now actually have a working system. I'm currently running synth card from my Kung Fu Flash. So I'm simulating a real cartridge on that. And I have the audio out hooked up to my studio speakers here. <laughs> and it actually works. And the first pedal input is auto assigned to the cutoff. which actually works fine and we can assign the second potentiometer to something else. Uh, like 
the LFO. And that also works. So we have audio out, we have video out through the normal Commodore 64 output. A synth card starts up. We have functionality on the pedals that are internally added here. And uh, my Messiah cartridge, which I'm not going to take a deep dive into right now because that requires uh, some reading of the manual, which I'm too impatient for for this video. But that should also start up, which it does. And uh, our switches also work. We can uh, switch to the dual sit setup as intended. And this should all work fine. Uh, yeah, it's a super powerful cartridge, basically a sequencer software that equals modern sequencer software for the Commodore 64. And this should be able to use the dual SIT setup, so both SITs separately, but uh, as I said, I'm not going to dive into that just yet because it is going to take some time to learn everything. So we're going to focus on the synth card and we should be able to program the EEPROM that is currently in here in a way so that we can add the synth card image to that, the binary, in the correct spot. So the first cartridge image on this should be the synth card and then we should be able to start that up with uh, flipping our switch here. Currently, it just starts up with an empty cartridge image, I think. Not sure what's on that EEPROM, that's just the test EEPROM. We are going to make our own EEPROM, I think. So we are going to extract the EEPROM physically. And I think I want to extract it digitally as well. <laughs> and just replace that one cartridge image on here, basically. So I have a new 27C801 EEPROM, which this also is and we're going to burn our own EEPROM for this machine. Hopefully with a startable synth card on there. So I'm going to download a cartridge image of synth card, which is available on GitHub. We should be able to download a synth card binary cartridge ROM. That should be this one. And yeah, that is eight kilobytes, so that's a standard eight kilobyte cartridge ROM, which we should be able to put on our EEPROM and start from there. So the first step is going to be uh, cloning the contents of our original ROM that this shipped with. Not going to do any more changes, just uh, clone this and add the cartridge ROM that we just downloaded to the EEPROM in the correct spot and then burn it into a new EEPROM of the same type. So let's see if we can clone this. 27C801. And that is an ST ROM, I think. So that's the standard one. Should select that. <clears throat> and we should be able to read the contents. Okay, we, uh, we now have our system ROM. You can see the basic prompt here. We have our EVO ROM in memory. And there should be all the ROMs that were in this example ROM and it's filled to the brim. <laughs> so we can save this. And I'm just going to save it on the desktop and call it EVO64 example ROM binary. And now we should be able to add our synth card to the first uh, slot in this ROM that is reserved for cartridges. And there's a handy guide on the EVO 64 site, which has all the information on how to access the cartridge ROMs and uh, kernel ROMs and basic ROMs and character ROMs that are on that EEPROM. Yeah, as I've said, we have to close this jumper to enable cartridge ROMs in the first place. And here's a chart of what goes where, basically. Yeah, we have the different supported EEPROMs. So, and we have uh, the 27C801 
Ah, the first cartridge slot is actually empty. That's probably what's on the demo ROM. That's why it didn't start up anything. So uh, this is where we want to add our synth card. That is position number one, cartridge position number one. And that starts at dollar two oh 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 oh. And that's where we want to add our cartridge. And there's also the jumper settings for that listed here should be activated by just activating the JTAG uh, cartridge enable jumper, which is what we wired up there. Yeah, that should be doable by just adding our cartridge image into this position, which should be pretty easy to do with the ePromer software. So we are going to open our file. Synth card, open. And we want to load it in normal mode and not clear the buffer. Disable. And we want to load it into 2000. That's our hexadecimal start address where we want to insert our file. It uh, probably should work this way and we should be able to insert our cartridge image here. There we go. Let's see if we have something at two zero 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 that resembles a synth card there we go synth card yeah version 2.0.1 which is actually a newer version than what we started i started an old version previously so this is probably even better let's try and burn this on an EEPROM. I'm not quite sure if my spare M27C801 EEPROM is going to work because I wrote a question mark on there at some point in history. I don't remember why. Maybe it's a broken EEPROM, but we're going to find out shortly. Okay, uh, my file is in the buffer here. We should be able to program our device. Let's see. Or oh, let's do a blank check first, probably. It says okay. So the uh, EEPROM ID is okay. And it also checked okay as blank. Let's try and program this. Program. This is going to take a while. It's doing its thing. Hopefully it passes. I really don't want to calculate how much of my life I wasted watching progress bars. <laughs> it's verifying. Yay, programming successful. The question mark didn't mean anything, it seems. Uh, we are hopefully going to see the regular C64 startup because all the switches are in zero position. Yay! That worked! Let's see if the synth card starts up from the EEPROM. Should be the first switch on the back side here. Whew. Let's see. Synth card. Yay! It works! Nice! So we have a C64 synthesizer. We don't need to insert a cartridge anymore to run synth card, which is what was the goal, basically. Yeah, this is exactly how I wanted this to work. <laughs> I'm just going to add a bit of tape over the little window in the EEPROM so it doesn't get erased accidentally, which takes a long time if you just have a regular daylight. And of course, uh, this also still works as a box standard C64 with some added capabilities. <laughs> You could also play pedal games uh, with these pedal controllers, obviously, because they are just regular pedals just connected internally. So that would also be a nice feature to try. Let's see if the keyboard overlay still fits with the knobs. And of course, this is not going to feel like a professional synthesizer or anything like that. It's just basically uh, some plastic that actuates the keys underneath so yeah but it works it clips on quite nicely actually the previous owner already put these uh, stickers on there 
with the names of the notes for the keys, which is helpful because I'm not a keyboardist. And these should be the exact keys used by a synth card. This is kind of a standard layout. And you can still access the other keys. I'm not sure if I'm going to use this, but it fits and I can still access my cutoff and uh, other function knob here. This is going to be so much fun to play with. Okay, I'm not going to show you too much of my non-existent musical skills. There's another thing that I saw other people do and that is to uh, replace the keys with white keys or brighter keys and uh, actually leave the black keyboard keys as black or brown in this case keys. And I actually have a spare keyboard that somebody hacked together, which is completely broken and I've only used for like spare key stems and things like that. Maybe I can come up with something fun to actually use this standalone without the keyboard overlay. Yeah, let me see what, what keys I have and if I can make that work. That would be fun to to do, I guess. This is from a C64C that I bought ages ago, which was completely broken. Someone had broken a lot of traces on that, but I have this keyboard, which I, as I said, used for spares and things, but I have most of the keycaps still. And these are actually from a Commodore 16, but it's a Commodore 64 keyboard. Some of the keys are from Commodore 64s with uh, the white keys. And maybe I can just use these gray keys as my white keys, basically. Yeah, we're going to see. Maybe this is cool. And there we go. It looks a bit unfortunate because some of these keys are from an actual C64C. I kind of like it. I mean, it looked kind of shoddy with these uh, drilled bits and things like that. So I'm pretty satisfied with this. It looks like a musical C64, which was the goal of this whole process. I think that's the final product. We just have to put the screws back in. And there we go! Yeah, that is one punk rock looking kind of Commodore 64 with an Evo 64 board in it. I added some pedal inputs, I added proper audio output jacks, modded the keyboard a bit. And yeah, this starts up to the synth card when I flip a switch in the back, which is what I aimed for. Sounds great because the Evo uh, preamps add quite some nice overtones to the SIT signals. Dual SITs in here, which should be accessible through things like the Messiah cartridge. We can also just switch this back to kind of a regular C64 with some added capabilities through the EVO board. But yeah, we can use this to play games and things like that as well. So hope this was kind of an inspiring video. I've been planning to do this for a long time and now I finally did it and I'm pretty satisfied with the results. There's always room for improvements. Uh, so if you have any ideas about what to add to this, please let me know in the comments. I think that's it for today. Thank you very much for your support on Patreon and on the channel memberships page and also on Ko-fi and elsewhere. Thanks for your thumbs and your subscriptions. Hope to see you again on this channel sometime. I'm Jan Beta. Thanks for watching. 
See you next time. Bye.